Howdy neighbor. We are gonna be talking about gaslighting. Gaslighting is something that I feel like in our culture, the term is highly abused and therefore highly misunderstood. It's kind of taken to mean anytime you offend me or belittle me, you're gaslighting me, which is not the proper definition. This definition has been very important to me because on systemic levels, we were a part of a lot of communities. They did it all the time. We did it all the time. I did it all the time, not even being aware of it. According to Oxford, gaslighting means to manipulate someone by psychological means into questioning their own sanity. To look at Wikipedia's definition, it says gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation where a person or group, and this is important because it's not just individuals. In fact, most of the experiences for us have been with a group or a system of thought that sows seeds of doubt in another individual or group, making them question their own perception or judgment. And it uses misdirection and delegitimizes the victim's belief. So to summarize, Wikipedia once again says there's two main components. Gaslighting depends on first convincing the victim that his thinking is distorted and secondly persuading them that the victimizer or the victimizer system are the correct ideas and the true ones. So the two key factors here that I see, one is um, something is said by someone um, that discounts what someone else is saying. But the second thing is, basically the result of it is, is that the person who is being gaslit feels like they're going crazy. So those are two of the most important factors. The third factor, which I think is worth just tossing in there, is that this is almost always done covertly and not explicitly. And it's the covertness that actually drives the people crazy. Because if I just say, oh, you're crazy, uh, you can combat that and deal with that and you treat it for what it is, like it's kind of like an attack on you. But when it's done more subversively, it's that subversiveness that causes some of the psychological problems. So to get into this story, I have to go back in time a little bit. Right around one year ago, our family got a phone call that was from a Bible camp that we had grown up at our entire life. It was the camp Cammie and I met at uh, more than 20 years ago. I literally went to this place for family camps and kid camps, and then as soon as I was a teenager, I'd go back there for chunks of time, like two, one month, two months at a time. I loved this place. It was religious and it was spiritual, and I highly valued that at one time in my life. And one year ago, we were planning on going to this camp to cook, just to volunteer, and we got a phone call a number of weeks before and they said, based upon what they saw in one of our videos, we were not welcome back that year, like in a course of two weeks, um, because we no longer believed that it was a sin to be gay. This was not a surprising uh, phone call for us. I wasn't like shocked or anything. The timing was, it was still like painful, but it wasn't like, oh my gosh, how can this happen? Like. I never imagined it. We made a series of videos about it, sharing our story. There was quite a bit of hoopla and friends and family contacted us and reached out to us and said how sorry they were. For the most part, it was a pretty caring environment that was created. And it did make for a difficult summer because our family was split up. Some of our kids were still allowed to go to the camp even though our family as a unit wasn't allowed to, which is a little bit weird and confusing. But we got through it and then went on to have what I would consider one of the best years of our life, partially because of this transition that we had gone through. At the year mark, which was this week, I posted, I think for the first time since originally addressing it, just kind of a one year update story that showed, reminded people like what had happened and then told them what the year was like for us. And it said, you know, reminded people that like, camp was the circle I grew up in, this place that I had volunteered hundreds of hours. And so I just told the story. And then I just said like, at the time, like, and even now, it's a little bit hard because 
we realized that we had like given up these things like this place we used to go during the summer to connect with family we don't have that anymore but then after just like this one paragraph of sharing the difficulty i go very quickly on to say but very soon we realized that we weren't alone and we immediately uh, started hearing stories from people that reached out to us and ultimately i concluded that our life of being able to be kind of like cut free from the system of thought that we were very socially bound to resulted in a lot of freedom for us. Freedom to listen to people, to hear stories we'd never heard before, and to be open to new ideas that we couldn't previously consider. And with that post, I posted this cute picture of me, I like to think I'm cute, with my mom from, I think I was one, uh, from this actual Bible camp as a kid. The next day, I made another post on Instagram, on our Fight For Together channel, and I followed it up with one of the lessons that was the most interesting thing I learned from this entire experience, which was my initial response was embarrassment when I first heard about this. Like I felt like I did something wrong and my gut reaction was to be quiet about this because I didn't want to make people look bad and I didn't want to cause waves and it just, it felt kind of guilty for me. Like I felt like I was the one that had like got busted or was in trouble, even though I wasn't ashamed of what I believed and I, I still don't have a problem with it. But even in the midst of that, kind of like what we've got into, like the habit we've got into with our social media and our vlog for the last five years now almost, is just trying to tell the truth of wherever things are at and not try and just post the positive stuff. Like we've posted a ton of negative stuff that we've gotten flack for. Even in this post, I kind of said, like one of my fears of posting this type of stuff initially and a year later, is that I knew some people are gonna accuse us of trying to get revenge or just trying to get attention or trying to take the Bible camp down. Even though, I, I think this is important to say, we never used the Bible camp's name or like gave away details that would like, like we would never called for a boycott. We never called for a cancellation. We never told our friends and family that were going there to stop going there. Like even the year that we got kicked out, my parents still went and some of my kids went and we were sad that we couldn't go, but we still encouraged them to go. So then I give kind of like these two, I don't know, advice type things of what I've learned uh, that I think would be helpful that I just wanted to start a conversation with. One is if you are on the inside of a religious organization specifically, but it could be any organization that excludes people, demand clarity and specificity when it comes to the criteria for exclusion. So if they're gonna kick people out for things, make sure the organization is very clear about it, which I did not feel like happened with us. On the website, it said biblical marriage or some phrase like that. It, but I think what they should say if they're gonna kick me out is say, you need to believe that it's a sin to be gay if you're gonna work in the kitchen. Because I think that clarity communicates to everyone like, oh, this is the standard. Like you don't need to be ashamed of it if you actually believe it. Like just post it publicly so everyone knows where it's at and knows that they could be kicked out. It just kind of creates fairness. And the second thing is that whatever that standard is, and I'm not even judging it, I was just speaking to some criteria that I think makes it more fair, whatever that standard is, enforce it universally. Make sure it applies to everyone. And the reason why I said this was because I know for a fact there's all sorts of people that work at camp that they believe it's fine to be married and gay, but they're not kicked out, which kind of creates this question of like, why are we kicked out uh, and not them? Is it really the belief that the camp is afraid of or is it something else? The second thing that I posted on this Instagram page is kind of appealing to people and sharing the benefit that we experience by sharing our story. So I said, if you've been kicked out of someplace or if you've been through some sort of trauma, I think it's extremely beneficial to share your story with as much specificity and honesty as you can bear. Even if you're the only person who listens, don't let them, uh, anyone, invalidate your voice. Okay, so these things are a little bit scary to post. Like, in fact, the day I posted it, I was like, okay, I'm just getting ready to get like a whole crap storm of stuff coming at us from social media, which has happened in the past. 
But the response was overwhelmingly positive. Here's one example. Nina writes, as a gay married Christian, words fall short when I try to explain how much it means to me and others when people stand up for us. You have not shared specifics about the camp and sharing your story is part of why I follow you guys. And it was just so cool to hear and to realize that our story of pain can actually help other people out there feel not alone. And so many more people than I expect uh, kind of rose out of the woodwork and said like, oh, we have been through that same type of thing. But this is a video about gaslighting. So you guys know, not all the feedback was positive. So the comments I'm gonna be posting are from a guy named Dave. His comments are reticent. Is that a word that I'm looking for? They are reminiscent of a much larger system. And I think he very accurately symbolizes what that system believes, at least in the way that we were a part of it. As much as I can tell from his bio and me knowing in the past, he's currently a pastor that he's been for most of the last 20 years. And we went to the same Bible college where I voted for him to be the student body president, which I think he won. The reason why I voted for him was because I liked his tattoos. His first comment says, Ben, consider it from their side. They have a deep biblical conviction that is thousands of years old, shared by billions around the world and informed by sacred texts. You yourself held this view for most of your life. The result of being excluded from this community is directly related to choices you have made. Embrace it. Whether they handled it well or not is not the point. This really appears petty and pandering. This is a really fascinating response to me because what comes clear from this language that he is using, both blatantly and subversively, is that my opinion is more or less irrelevant. I mean, these kind of phrases he uses to say, first of all, consider the other side. As if I haven't considered the other side. I mean, I lived on the other side for close to 35 years. So I consider myself very aware of the other side. I'm not even against the other side. You know, I know why they did what they did, which is why I was like very specific about what I asked for. To this day, I've never made fun of their beliefs. Like I feel like I know the way that they read the Bible and that the way that a lot of them navigate life, not all of them because no two people are the same, but this system teaches and breeds this certain amount of respect that results in what happened to us, of course. And our story is also valid and true. But by saying these things as a response to our story, he's, he, I'm saying like, okay, there's this foundation and this is true. And he's kind of come, coming back and saying, no, your thing doesn't really matter because what really matters is all of these facts, the facts that this is a deep biblical conviction that they have. It's biblical, so it's more important than yours. It's thousands of years old, so it's more important than yours. It's shared by billions of people, so it's more popular, so it's more important than yours. It comes from sacred texts, so it's more important than yours. So what is just as important as what he's saying is kind of like what he's not saying. Then he kind of puts the burden on us for this situation that we're in by saying, these are choices you have made which is fascinating for a number of reasons. One is, do you get to choose what you believe? When you stop believing in Santa Claus, was that a choice you made to stop believing in Santa Claus? Or did you get to a point where you saw something or learned something and you actually couldn't believe in Santa Claus anymore? I want to believe in Santa Claus. I thought it was awesome at that stage of my life, but I got to a point where the information I had didn't line up with Santa Claus existing. And when that happened, to force belief would have been disingenuous and I actually think like more or less impossible. The second interesting thing to me is biblically speaking, at least for the way most people interpret the Bible, Christians don't get their faith in God from themselves anyways. They believe it comes from God himself and God chooses who he gives faith to anyways. So by all measures of the world, I don't know if it was my choice or my fault, therefore, for getting excluded. Now, I'm willing to take full responsibility and say I believe what I did and I know it doesn't fit in with their belief system. That I can agree with. But to say it's someone's fault who doesn't fit in, 
not for a behavior that they do, but for a belief that they have, I think there's a pretty strong case that the responsibility could go either way. Now finally, he calls my post petty and pandering. So I write back and I say, you know, I've embraced this last year of my life. Like I don't consider myself like a victim, uh, but I'm asking like what part of my post feels petty and pandering to you? And he says, all of it. And his logic for this is they haven't moved, you have. As if the fact that this isn't surprising shouldn't make it painful or something like that. But he doesn't stop there. He goes a step further and he accuses us of dragging them publicly before our audience. And he says that feels petty. So he's actually uh, denoting um, or putting on us a motive, which is to kind of ruin them or get some sort of revenge or hurt them, which one is a big stretch, especially given that we, given that we kept it anonymous. So when, when he says to drag them, I guess I'm wondering who is them that you're talking about since it's anonymous? Are you talking about the actual Bible camp, which isn't the case, or are you talking about a system of belief that I'm challenging, which I absolutely uh, am challenging the way it's enforced, and why is, do you have a problem with me challenging a system of belief? And how does that feel petty? Now the irony is, I actually think that he is the one turning us into victims because we don't feel like victims. Like I said, this has been the best year of our life. I understand uh, the camp and why they did what they did. And really, we haven't thought about it a whole lot. That's not to say it wasn't difficult and painful, but it didn't like form our entire year. But I tell him, you know, I gave very specific and limited suggestions, uh, which is a pretty vulnerable thing to do. Um, like I wasn't just saying you guys suck. I was like, hey, this hurt, here's some suggestions for how to improve the process. And I said, I'm open to hearing. If anyone disagrees with those things, the fact that things should be posted specifically and applied universally, I would love to hear the problems people have with that. If people disagree with that, let's talk about that. I'm sure there are some cons about it and it's not the most common belief. But if their only solution is for us to remain silent about it, or if we're not silent, we're being accused of dragging people through it just for telling our story anonymously even, that does not make sense. And that's not something I can agree to. The only other alternative that I know of of what they could ask for is for us to like repent for our new beliefs. But neither repenting or remaining silent, I couldn't do either of those things with a clear conscience. So even though this person is accusing me of having an attitude, I actually think they have more of a problem with our story than they do our attitudes, which is why they not attack our arguments, but they go on to attack us specifically by calling our story and our post petty. But our life and the damage that was inflicted by this series of events felt not very petty to us. We, we talked about in these the videos that we made a year ago. I think these decisions cost us uh, in the range of $10,000 because we had already rented our house out, it split our family up for the summer, it canceled our summer plans and our future summers and resulted in us saying goodbye to one of our favorite places and one of my favorite childhood memories. So like that's petty, like to talk about that and to be sad about that, even if it's not anyone's fault. I'm not even, you know, that's the funny thing. I never accused one person or said they need to change. They need to invite us back. This isn't fair. I never said any of that. There was two specific things I suggested, but besides that, all I did was share that, hey, this happened to us and it was hard. And in fact, the difficulty that we've gone through and being able to exit from some of this culture brought us the biggest value which was no longer making value judgments on other people's story or pain. Something that is being happening to us in this type of post, which is a form of gaslighting. So as a pastor that's writing this, I think this is really important, not just for this person, but for anyone inside this belief system. Because the way it goes is when you leave Christianity, when you leave a church, 
There is no exit interview. No one asks you why. No one asks you to share about your new belief system. When you leave, it's kind of assumed that you are like downgraded material. Even the words that are used to describe a person that is like left a church or left a faith are things like backslidden or lost, like you lost your faith. I understand from that perspective that you feel like I've lost the biggest thing that you identify with. But having lived it for 30 years, could there not be any benefit uh, that you could learn from someone who's left uh, at all just from listening or talking or hearing? And that's what's fascinating here is I'm fine with just telling our story and refraining from judgment on either side, both for the camp uh, or for us. And all I'm asking is why isn't the other side willing to do the same? Why can't they just hear the story? Why do they have to discount the person that's telling the story by saying, oh, you're being petty, you're being vic uh, acting like a victim, uh, inferring all these motives that just aren't true. Dave replies, I don't see how airing it out before the world benefits us. Now, even this like airing out phrase, it kind of like comes with this like, oh, in the closet, like negative, terrible belief that you have or thing that's happened to you. As if like we're now the oppressor by airing someone's like dirty laundry. But we just didn't see it this way. Like we had, we didn't see it as a negative belief that we had and we didn't even like, weren't trying to bring anyone down. We were just trying to tell a story because one thing that's become really clear to us about the Christian value system is that there are pros and cons. And it works for a lot of people. There was a lot of years where it was the best thing and the best years of my life because of this belief system. It gave me focus, it gave me community. I loved it and wouldn't trade it for anything. But one of those things I wasn't aware of in those years was the types of people that didn't fit in to that system the entire time. Some of them stopped fitting in and fell off. And when they fall off, we don't really like think about them or celebrate them. Or like I said, we never really asked exit interview questions for them to explain like why they were leaving. We just kind of like assumed, oh, they're kind of making a poor or a bad choice. And there was people that never fit in to begin with. Now, some people are gonna say, well, that was their choice. Sometimes it is. A lot of times it's not. That's what I love about the culture nowadays is a lot of people are asking the question, what do you do when people who are discriminated against and never had the choice, like how can you make that right? And it's very complicated with the racism thing, with the gender thing. And in the spiritual world, if you, based upon your sexual preference, based upon the types of sins that you are prone to, there was some people that never had a chance. So his only response to me is, why don't you just leave without complaining? He says, be about what you are about, but you can't expect to others to be about the same thing that's short-sighted and immature to criticize them for the same thing you believed for years. You have shifted your view, fine. Why are you so certain in your new belief that you feel somehow justified to speak poorly of others? But here's my question. What if I'm not complaining? And that's what's weird. When I read my post, I don't really, like I said, I'm, I'm not complaining about what happened to us. I've fully accepted it and I think I've come to peace with it. But I do still care about the people at camp. If I was to complain about anything there, it would be the food at camp, which we were supposed to be there to help cook and make better. But I get it, like I think I know why it operates. And like I said, I believe there's pros and cons, but I don't believe just because you've been excluded from the organization, whether it's by your choice or not, that that needs to exclude you from the conversation about what could potentially improve the environment, both for outsiders like me, but especially for the people that are still inside of it. So I say, this is not a complaint. As long as you see us as complaining, you're gonna see us as victims. Something I'm not asking. I'm not asking for anyone's sympathy. I'm not asking to be seen as a victim. I never once criticized them for their actual beliefs about sexuality or whatever. And that's something that I, I even get crap from is like on one side, like the Christians are saying, you're not uh, conservative enough. 
And then some of our liberal, more political friends are saying, you need to boycott that place, you need to start picketing it, like you need to post their name publicly and bring them down. I'm actually not interested in either of those things at all. I don't see myself affiliated with any organization, whether it be political or in a party or a or group on either side. I wanna love and help either side and I feel like I have a perspective uh, that I think will, can still help the people inside the Bible camp actually. Because these type of exclusionary tactics that are being used at the Bible camp, if they're used in any organization, I don't care if it's religious, and, and I've experienced this in places of employment where we've man manipulated and hurt people on a professional level that I've had to apologize for. In other religious organizations, it's not just Bible camp, even in a family situation where vagueness favors the powerful. And if people can be vague about the criteria and then implement it whenever they want, uh, it's not really what they're advertising. And this is important because what the Bible camp is advertising is that these criteria are important for purity and for holiness and for these kind of like spiritual virtues that they don't want us to like taint and hurt the camp or the campers. And I'm like, okay, great, fine. If it really is about those things, then you should be enforcing it universally. But I don't think it is about those things. They are very specific and people who go to these places, they know it's okay to believe these things it's not okay to speak about them. He asks why we have to be so certain about this. And <laughs> this like is such a gross mischaracterization of how I feel about this. I wasn't certain of any of it. We've never gone to camp and tried to convert people and tell people what they should think about the Bible and sexuality. Like I said, with Santa Claus, this is one of those things we used to believe that it was a sin to be gay and a lot of other things. Masturbation, uh, you know, sex outside of marriage, you name it, being naked, co-ed, like being dressed less modestly where people could see certain body parts or even use their imagination. And gradually, the more that we matured and looked into those beliefs, we stopped being able to believe them. But it was like a fight, like we had like, we're like gradually letting go of things we could no longer justify hanging on to. And as you're like still in a community or having the process of like exiting, the question we consistently ask, and we hear this all the time with people, is what's the absolute least amount I can share while still being able to live my, with myself? And basically that's the amount we shared, which is why in a brand of ours with these videos that we've tried to be known for our honesty and talk about the things that people don't want to talk about, we never really brought up the sexuality thing except for in a Q&A format when someone asked us, what do you believe? So we answered it. And then the camp hears about this video because they're looking for this type of stuff, evidently. And then they came to us, like not about anything we said or did to them, but about a video we made confessing a belief that I happen to know a lot of people still at camp actually also believe. They're just not as public as us about it. So finally, uh, Dave says, great, stop complaining and worrying about what they do. Every religious organization has boundaries. Go find one you fit in. Which is like so weird to me because here we are on our little corner of the internet sharing our own beliefs. We don't force anyone to be a part of it. Like I said, we make thousand, hundreds, more than a thousand videos using this exact same format where we share like what we believe and our observations about the world. And all of a sudden, when it becomes threatening to something that is core to Dave's identity, he accuses us of complaining and worrying and aggressively trying to change other people and attack and bring down other people. And it's like, you don't get to pick and choose what our motives are just because it's not convenient for you. Also, where are you finding the authority to tell us what to do, what to believe, and how to live our life? We don't go to your church, dude. In our two posts on Instagram, there was some very specific facts that we laid out. Facts that he never addresses. Those facts are 
The Bible camp we had been dedicated to our entire lives kicked us out. And that's important to me because a lot of people don't realize that this can happen to you. I just want you to know, no matter how core you are, how dedicated you are to, and close to the inside, no matter how many years you've put your blood, sweat, and tears, you could get a phone call from a low-paying part-time staff member that was hired the year before, and the people that hugged you, that were on the board and said, love you, brother, you're one of us, your family for years will be nowhere to be found. This is a story that has happened to us numerous times. We've heard and seen it happen to other people numerous times, and it's not uncommon, and it can happen to you. That's a fact that I put out in our story. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to tell our story. And the next thing is that we were excluded after 39 years of dedication based upon principles that are stated vaguely and enforced sporadically. Dave never talks about those facts. Now instead, what Dave chooses to address in his posts are not the facts that I lay out in my story, but he chooses to address my character, assume my motive, and the validation of my story itself. These are things that he says. He accuses us of playing victim or presenting myself as a casualty. He accuses our story of just being complaining, a takedown piece, he calls it short-sighted, immature, petty, disingenuous, and kind of alludes to the fact that we're disloyal by saying that they've stood by these beliefs and we were the ones that kind of like fell away. Now these are classic gaslighting techniques. This is why this is so important. Remember I said one of the key attributes of gaslighting is that at the end of the day it causes you to feel like you're crazy. Now we went through years and years of years of feeling like we were crazy because in biblical communities your motive is everything. If people assume or allude to you being selfish or unloving or prideful, trying to hurt someone else, it feels like almost everything that you want to do is now tainted and is no longer valid. So even though I lay out these facts very clearly, very specifically, he goes on to pull and focus on these seven things that are not validated by any of the facts that I put out or any of our like track record. And this is like really scary to me because I consider myself like one of the more outspoken people I knew. Like when I saw this opportunity, I was like, hell yeah, thank you for gaslighting me, let's go. Like what a wonderful opportunity, praise the Lord. Most people that are in Dave's church or are in religious organizations and feel isolated and alone, when they leave, they do not have a platform like we have. They do not have the years of therapy or the clarity or the confidence to stand up to the organization they were raised in. And instead of feeling like you can stand up and speak your voice and like it's valid, it's far easier to convince yourself, they must be right, I must suck, something's wrong with me. The final thing that Dave introduces is the story that his story of what he believes and teaches, which is pretty clear, and, and I am, consider myself pretty versed and aware with this story, having lived it and tried to convert people to it for multiple decades, is that his story is now more important than our story. By the way, I'm not saying that our story is more important than his. I just believe that they can both coexist and that when you lay claim that yours is more important than anyone's, whether it be a child's, or someone who doesn't fit into your religious organization, or someone that doesn't fit into your sporting organization, when you say ours is more important than yours, not just you don't fit our criteria. Like, I'm totally fine with saying we don't fit Bible Camp's criteria. Like, I get that. Uh, I didn't have a problem with that. Like I said, all I said was state the criteria clearly and enforce it universally. But everyone, every club can have their criteria. I'm okay with that. But when you go a step further and say, my criteria and my story and my club is better than your story, uh, which he does numerous times by saying that, well, you used to believe this. He flat out at the end tells us to be quiet and to stop posting this stuff. He doesn't listen to our facts or address them or take them seriously. And he kind of appeals to the fact that they're the normal, they're the popular, they're the like orthodox as if like that makes their story more valid than ours. So that makes me believe that this type of gaslighting 
is one very prominent and it is very dangerous. It's hard to spot. It's always done covertly. In my opinion, it'd be so much more healthy if someone like him said, you are f crazy. Uh, you're stupid. You're dumb. Your opinion's not valid. We don't believe you, but they don't say those words. Instead, they say it with the words that they don't say and they show it. But the net result is the same, which is the person who is on our end of which we are the least of the victims, I think. They feel that message very clearly, but they're not able to articulate it because it's never stated. Finally, I know this has been a long video. Thank you for hanging with me. Uh, thanks, Dave, for leaving the stuff. I wanna end off with a paragraph that's been very helpful to me in understanding the way these dynamics work and what our role can be in pursuing health, regardless of what side or club you're in, because I don't care. My goal is not to convert people to get out of Bible camp or to not go to church or to go to church or to be gay or whatever. Like I, just, I just don't care. These are patterns that show up everywhere. And the more I understand them, the less I find myself gaslighting my kids. Like that could be a whole video. This is by Judith Herman, who wrote this manual called Trauma and Recovery. Um, and she says, the ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness. When we feel something painful, we try and take it away from our mind. Remembering and telling the truth about ter terrible events are prerequisites, both for the restoration of the social order and for the healing of individual victims. Denial, repression, and disassociation operate on a social as well as an individual level. Meaning that when we keep things down, we do it as individuals, like we keep the pain down, like PTSD and stuff, but also as communities, we tend to push pain down and push people that have pain toward the outside so we don't have to hear about it. It is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. Secrecy and silence are the perpetrator's first line of defense. So these are things, like I said, guys, this isn't about taking sides. I would love to see Bible Camp, this Bible Camp, or any organization that cares about people to be more transparent with these things. Be clear about what, you know, if, if you don't want people that believe it's okay to be gay, write that on your damn website. Like, if you're so proud about it, say it. And then when you boot someone, post that on the website too. You can put my face on there, I don't mind. But instead of all these victims kind of like uh, filtering away and never being heard from and never seen, then no one who's on the inside is able to fully assess the cost of what their belief system is. And I know it sounds weird, but don't say you're doing it out of love for me to keep me anonymous and secret. Uh, it's because it's hard to talk about sometimes and it looks bad and we don't wanna talk about the black sheep, but we have so much to learn from the black sheep regardless of what system you're in. And if you're on the outside, I hope you consider sharing your story. Thanks guys for listening. I'd love to hear in the comments if this is helpful for you or if it inspires anything. Oh, wow. Dave? It's easy to waste our time. And if we're doing it, our kids are doing it. We wrote a book about how we created a schedule and transformed our family's panic into purpose all in one week. It's time to do a workout. The book has all the tools and mindsets that we use and is basically the best of content of like a thousand videos and you can read it in less than an hour. Are you ready to change your week? 